Guide to EAA, or Electronically Assisted Astronomy. Hello, and a brief introduction. My name is Mike Keefe, and I am the self-proclaimed astro nerd. Uh, I am a finance and accounting professional by day, but it's really in the area of uh, astronomy and space exploration uh, where my passion really lies. I've been an active member of the Raleigh Astronomy Club since 2006, and I've been observing the night sky since 2003. But my interest uh, in space was was really sparked when um, back as a kid I watched the first space shuttle launch in 1981. One thing that really motivates me um, in astronomy is is educating others um, and. In 2014, uh, I was awarded the Master of Astronomy Outreach uh, through the Astronomical League, uh, and that was for achieving 250 hours of public outreach. And then in 2018, I joined the NASA JPL Solar System Ambassador Corps, and that really was a good fit to expand um, my outreach activities um, to the local community. Today, um, as per the title of this guide, uh, my pursuits really uh, are focused around EAA and video astronomy. And you can catch more about me on www.astronerd.net. We're gonna take this guide and it's gonna be broken up into four different sections. The first section, we're going to talk about what is EAA, why would you want to do EAA, and we're going to set some realistic expectations. In section two, we're going to cover the basics and just getting started. In section three, I'll go through some equipment recommendations. And in section four, we'll go through setting up your gear for EAA. What is EAA, or Electronically Assisted Astronomy? So we'll provide a brief history of video astronomy and EAA. The first reference that I could ever find of anything related to video astronomy was in this 1928 article that was written by Donald Menzel of the Lick Observatory where they're discussing the emerging technology of television. This is where they would connect some sort of television camera to the telescopes of big observatories and then broadcast those throughout the United States. Then here we see a picture from 1961 of an amateur astronomer, uh, of the Sydney amateur astronomers. Uh, his name is Gil Miles. And you can see here, he's got his, um, <laughs> I would not say a very compact camera connected to his telescope. Uh, he's got his, um, uh, you know, very old looking, most likely black and white television. And um, what really gets me more is just his attire um, that he has set up for an evening of observing. Uh, but even back then, uh, 1961, uh, you do have people um, trying to leverage um, video cameras and television for observing. So now we continue a little bit uh, further into the modern era. And in the 1990s, uh, amateurs began to experiment with webcams, such as the Quick Cam and the Philips 2 Cam, as well as inexpensive CCTV security surveillance cameras. So the Super Circuits um, camera was an example of that. Now these cameras were actually okay for solar system objects. And then we jump into a little bit later in the 1990s and companies such as Stellacam, Malincam, and a few others uh, emerged with some very sensitive uh, but small chips. The innovations kept on coming. We finally got color, able to do some enhancements in the cameras, as well as cooling. And then by the mid to late 2000s, 
users started experimenting uh, with security surveillance cameras such as the LN300 and also various Samsung models. And this continued well into uh, the early part of the 2010s. So what is EAA? Oftentimes, um, you'll hear people refer to it as a type of imaging, um, or is it observing? And the reality is that it actually falls pretty much into both camps. It is both um, imaging and observing, but it's also neither. It actually falls very well in between the two. And you can almost think of it as a bit of a continuous spectrum. There are many similarities with both. So really, what is EAA? And you'll find that uh, definitions vary. So here's my opinion. So it developed out of video astronomy. And it's about um, the observing of the object and doing it as close as possible to real time and not necessarily collecting data for later especially post-processing. So again, the focus is around the object and not the picture. So instead of using an eyepiece, we're using the sensitivity of a camera to enhance of our view, our view of the object now, and again, not later. Also, it's about exploiting technology either in the camera, uh, and you can consider that integration, and we'll talk more about that at a later point, um, also using potentially a night division, night vision device, or using a computer, and we'll call that live stacking, to enhance our view of the object, again, now and not later. And then most purists will agree that if you do any sort of post-processing, it's no longer EAA, but rather it's imaging or astrophotography. And uh, for those of you familiar with Cloudy Nights, uh, which is a phenomenal uh, astronomy forum online, uh, it has been very much an evolving subject. Why do EAA? So one, it's going to help us increase our light grasp. And here's what I mean by that. So if we take a look at this example, this is a sketch of the Ring Nebula taken by a gentleman by the name of uh, Michael Rosalina. Um, it was taken from very dark skies uh, outside of, uh, or within Greenbrier, Green, Greenbrier County, West Virginia. And it's taken through a 14 inch SCT. Now, for reference, if we look at a screen grab that I took um, from my club's um, dark sky site, uh, although I think the skies have gotten worse, uh, via my 11-inch SCT, um, here's what we can see in terms of the difference. And again, I'm using an 11-inch telescope. If I try to find the very dimmest object that's in um, this sketch, it turns out it's about 15.3 um, magnitude. Yet, when you look at the dimmest possible object that I could find in my screen capture, it's a uh, magnitude of 18.5. So much, much more detail um, is available, much dimmer objects, plus you see it in color. And again, also take into account the fact that this is a smaller telescope under um, brighter skies. Another good reason is to go overcome light pollution. So I want to share with you the following screen grab uh, from a gentleman uh, by the name of Maurice Gavin. And he took this outside of greater London. So we're talking some major light pollution here. Yet in his 12 inch SCT at about 100 seconds, this is what he's able to capture. So again, in terms of overcoming light pollution, a fantastic option. It's also a great outreach tool. So for those of you that have ever done outreach, um, you may uh, remember the experience of having long queues of people lining up 
um, to take a view in the telescope, and every so often you having to jump in and you know confirm you know is the object still centered? Did someone bump it? Is the, the right focus for someone? Um, and it becomes very much a uh, one on one, very very limited time uh, sort of interaction with each person. However, when you use EAA, either uh, through broadcasting uh, to a monitor that lots of people can see, or in a couple of the examples here, you've got a projector um, shining the, um, uh, the image down onto the ground. So in this scenario, you can actually spend more time engaging the entire crowd and talking in more detail about the object. And also, people aren't sitting around uh, kind of just waiting in a line. And oftentimes I've noticed that people feel rushed by the time they finally get to the eyepiece to try and take a look and then not spend too much time because people behind them are waiting. So it is a way to um, do a bit of a deeper engagement on, on topics and, and things like that. Um, now, I'm not advocating at all that this takes the place of actually looking in an eyepiece uh, for um, uh, outreach. This is a way to augment that. So what are some other reasons why we might choose to do EAA? Well, first of all, uh, for those uh, who may have any sort of eye conditions or potentially any uh, physical disabilities, um, so you're not able to actually get up and stand um, and get your eye onto an eyepiece, EAA allows uh, access uh, to views uh, from a telescope. Additionally, uh, you may find that young children have difficulty looking through the eyepiece. I know uh, oftentimes um, I'll, I'll see little kids try to look at an eyepiece and or through an eyepiece, and when they actually wind up trying to get their head uh, or their, their 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 eyes closer to the eyepiece, it winds up hitting them right smack dab in the middle of the forehead. So uh, they do tend to have much more difficulty uh, trying to, to look. Um, with EAA compared to visual, um, you can actually enjoy images in color, assuming you're using a color camera, um, rather than just the shades of gray that typically um, you'll, you'll see, uh, at, at least from deep space objects um, visually through a telescope. And it does allow you to uh, do internet broadcasts of what you're seeing, as well as to do virtual star parties. Um, EAA is quite amenable to remote control and viewing. So if you live in a cold environment uh, and want to be able to enjoy um, the night sky, but from the comfort of a nice warm uh, room in your house, uh, EAA is very adaptable to that. Um, and also, using a camera, you're able to capture more photons, or you're sorry, you're able to capture pho photons more effectively than the human eye. So with your existing or smaller aperture scopes, you're able to get more detail and capture um, you know, those dimmer objects than you could visually. Compared to astrophotography, you can actually view dozens of objects in an evening versus Astrophotography, you tend to be doing you know, hours and hours on each object, limiting um, your, the potential of you know, maybe one to two, uh, maybe three if you're up all night um, um, trying to capture uh, through astrophotography. And then given that uh, when I'm recording this, uh, it's 2020, we're in the pandemic, um, this does allow for socially distant astronomy, so you can set up the scope, set up the monitor, uh, and make sure that people aren't, uh, you know, coming up to your telescope potentially, um, you know, contaminating that telescope or, or uh, getting uh, too close to interactions with you. Uh, so you can set up those views. People can still enjoy the night sky, still enjoy the views, uh, but you can be far enough away to be safe. So what are some drawbacks with regards to um, EAA? I'd say the first one is depending upon your setup, it can be way more difficult uh, to actually set up, operate, and take down. You have to deal with more cables. You've got to make sure you're bringing out a monitor or some device to actually uh, view your um, the image you're capturing. 
uh, and there's lots of other equipment compared to visual, um, especially um, having to uh, rely on some sort of remote power if you're not doing it where you have easy access to um, uh, 110 volt power. Um, the use of projectors, monitors, laptop screens uh, can very much produce uh, problematic stray light. So this is where um, visual astronomers um, really don't want a lot of um, stray light uh, from other devices potentially ruining their dark adapted eyes. So when you're doing EAA, make sure you're practicing good astro uh, neighbor behavior. And I will say that in astrophotography, a lot of people will use those red uh, ruby lith um, uh, covers on their laptop screens, which really dims the light down um, and allows them to use the uh, computer uh, and still maintain, uh, um, at least reduce the amount of stray light. That is a, still a drawback for EAA because the whole point of EAA is to see color. Um, so you really reduce your enjoyment of what you're looking at uh, in EAA if you're using that, that red uh, screen. So again, you've got to make sure you've got some sort of uh, solution to keep the uh, stray light uh, from ruining other people's uh, enjoyment. Um, definitely a lot more can go wrong um, viewing with a camera and all the other equipment rather than just a simple observing uh, setup or vi visual setup. And the also, also can be a steep learning curve, especially for uh, the software. Uh, I would recommend that um, several nights of experimentation are required. Um, and the best way to do that is just to focus on one task and get that done well, and then go on to the next one, but not trying to do too much at once. Um, you definitely don't want to um, introduce a lot of variables at the same time, because then you never know what went wrong and what to do to fix it. So when you're doing EAA, it said that the light grasp of your scope will increase anywhere from three to six times compared to that of an equivalent visual uh, telescope. EAA is great on very dim objects like galaxies, nebula, and globular clusters. However, when you're looking at open clusters, you're not going to get that same beautiful shimmering effect that you would through an eyepiece. And EAA cannot compete with the dynamic range of the human eye. For example, when you're looking at the Galilean moons of Jupiter, um, visually, it's no problem being able to see details on the face of Jupiter and also be able to see the moons. However, when you try and use EAA or even use um, a camera to take um, astrophotography with the same exposure, you can't get both the detail on the face of the object plus the dimmer details uh, such as the moons. Another good example of this is the Orion Nebula where uh, when you try and take a photograph of it or use an EAA, if you want to get that nebulosity on the outside, uh, you're, you're going to wind up blowing out the brighter core of the nebula that is uh, there with the trapezium uh, stars. However, if you want to just get those stars, uh, instead of blowing out, you want to be able to make out those stars in EAA or in an uh, astro uh, photograph, you're not going to get enough light or you're not going to see the details of the nebulosity outside. And then lastly, you're not going to get photo qual photographic quality views for only tens of seconds or even a few minutes of uh, capturing data with no processing. For example, if we take a look at this particular uh, capture, this was 20 seconds through my 11 inch scope using uh, my older CCD camera. And arguably, it's an amazing uh, capture for just 20 seconds uh, through an 11 inch telescope. And you can see um, you know, there's definitely detail in the spiral arms. Um, you can actually notice that you've got areas of star formation. You've got um, that bridge between um, the interacting galaxy and the main um, 
uh, Spiral Galaxy, you can see that as well. So detail is amazing, much more than you could see through an 11 inch visually. However, when you take a look at a photograph, 75 minutes worth of exposures through a C11, and it's been processed, um, there is no comparison. The detail, the color, um, and the basically you'll see the stars are uh, nice bright pinpoints. Um, even some of the background galaxies are visible here. So again, still you cannot compare just a few seconds to a few minutes of data capture to the uh, amount of time uh, in taking you know, over an hour plus of exposures.